Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I'd like to talk about politics, New York's political parties in the recent election, and I'm especially pleased to have my colleague, the ever popular political commentator and analyst, the host of CUNY TV's City Talk, Professor Doug Muzio. Oh, come we say? on, thank you. <laughs> so let's just start right on Go the ahead. election. Do you think if Freddie Ferrer had $50 million, he could have won the election? It, I, you know what? I think it's doubtful. The mayor had a good record, and if Freddie had $50 million, the mayor would have had $300 million. So the playing field well, never, let's, wouldn't let's, have been level. But assume the mayor didn't spend more okay. than what he spent. Even with a relatively equal amount of money, the question is, did the Ferrer campaign have the organization and the message to deliver it and effectively? Questionable. I don't know. So does a message automatically mean a reason for running? I would define message as, yes, a reason for running and an ex a, both an explanation of past behavior and a projection of future behavior. Do. Right. And you have to believe and, and prove that you're a better alternative than your opponent. That's exactly right. You can't just criticize. You've got to provide an alternative vision. I think that was the problem with Ferrer and all of the Democrats. They were never able to construct both an overarching critique of the mayor and to provide a compelling alternative vision. That was a problem. Well, they weren't um, big enough in personality and experience to run against a person who has the record that he had. In fact, that's true. I mean, none of the candidates had the combination of charisma, experience, and access to the media through money that, that Bloomberg had. Well, but even in the primary, I mean, some of them had money and they still didn't get anywhere. That's, but what's that's the matter correct. with the Democratic Party? Why does it consistently have candidates, at least in the last how many years have we had Republican mayors, and since Dinkins lost in his, his bid for re-election, which we agree is a difficult thing to do, okay. right? First What's of all, the matter with the Democratic Party? Well, I don't know. I don't know how much is the matter with the Democratic Party. If you look below the mayor, the controller won in an uncontested race. The public advocate a Democrat won in an uncontested because they race. Didn't, because they did the same thing only in reverse. There wasn't, well, I mean, but the, and but the problem. And 48 out of 51 but, members of the city council are Democrats. How badly did the Democrats do? Well, but the point is, the mayor is also really a Democrat. Well, and important. Perceived and perceived as such, I think, although people can complain as such. that and governed as such, but it still prove it still points to the Democratic Party as having something wrong with it. The vote is low, the candidates that they run are not um, f even. I mean, in the city council, some of the candidates I think were very good, some of them mm -hmm. are very mediocre. Mm -hmm. um, there is something wrong with the development of talent and fervor for a political party in a city that is. Yeah, I, so I, only, I only partially agree. I think the talent is there. I think, yes, the party has decayed and it's declined. It doesn't generate the candidates nor the electoral support it, it once did. But even though the Democratic Party is decaying, the Republican Party doesn't exist. Oh, there it's is comatose. no political. It's dead. Uh, exactly. So you're running at the mayoral level. Party has mattered much less than candidates do. Mayoral elections are candidate centered. But let's look at these four Republican elections. In 1993, Dave Dinkins lost by fewer than 50,000 votes at a 1.8 million cast. Really close election. Mike, then Rudy Giuliani wins a big second term, but Mike Bloomberg wins in 2001 on a total fluke, a total perfect storm, 9 11. Rudy Giuliani becoming a saint, Rudy Giuliani supporting Bloomberg, Bloomberg's $73 million, and the Democrats kill one another after the runoff. Well, so, yes, they win, and they win big in the second election, but the first elections tended to be so, flukes. So they, they killed each other four years ago in the runoff. So that leads me to the next question. The political parties, the Republican Party, you said, is dead and moribund. It isn't even existing. And I, don't, and I say the Democratic Party isn't either, that people in New York are Democrats. Whether they have a party or not, they're Democrats. Okay. And they vote on a Democratic line. Why don't we have nonpartisan elections? Because I don't think the case has been made for nonpartisan elections. I think the mayor tried to do it two years ago and several charter commissions earlier. I think nonpartisan elections on their face haven't proven to be what they claimed to be, and the mayor's charter commission was awful. The analysis was awful, the presentation was awful, and, was and the voters and the voters wisely voted it down. The system that they ultimately adopted was this Rube Goldberg system that didn't exist anywhere. It was just 
awful and it deserved to go down. You know, I, I know, I used to know Rube Goldberg. You did. I, I dated <laughs> his it. daughter, Susan. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, let's go on, though. Uh, go back to it. I didn't mean to interrupt you, <laughs> but you get so heated. Yeah, well, I, I'm a believer in parties. I believe that parties provide organization for those who might not otherwise be organized. Well, you, and it's the only way we can aggregate opinion into policy but in you, the United you, States. I mean, and you, you participated in party politics and in Absolutely. politics. Absolutely. And so did I in a long time. Now, why do you still believe in them? And I'm beginning to think that they are not producing what they should be producing. I mean, are you agreeing are you, with me on the Christian? Oh, no, I, I agree with you there that the parties are not. We've lost all sense, national and local, right? Well, in part, yes. I think the Republican Party, certainly on the national level and the governing level, is much more co coherent than the Democrats have ever been. You've got a ideologically coherent Republican Party, I really? think, Senate, and the, and the House. But you do have people there who are moderates. You do, but that moderate that's win been a, is... That has been an erosion because there used to be many more, right? The, it's small, it's still influential, but I would argue that the Republican Party has been become much more disciplined, much more ideological, much more structured along the lines of a traditional European party than the parties that we had been used to in the United States. Now, New York State, the Republican Party, is not what is it? It's in disarray or oh, what? Oh, it's in disarray. I mean, if it, it, it's not dead, but it's pretty comatose, too. The state's becoming bluer. It's becoming bluer in the sense that more and more voters are registering as Democrats, and it's also bluer because the Republicans have lost their strongholds. We have a county executive in Nassau County. Right, we have a Democratic right. county executive in Suffolk. We have a county executive in Westchester. We have a, a legislature in Nassau, a legislature in Suffolk. Brookhaven is now Democratic. <laughs> now, Much of the the state is, this, is moving democratic. Do you think they're moving democratic or are they moving reform? I don't know about reform. Reform. I just mean not corrupt. <laughs> I, I don't, don't know. I reform. come from New Jersey, so <laughs> corruption is always there. I don't think it's I don't think it's corrupt. I think the Republican Party simply doesn't produce on a statewide level. And locally, outside of New York, candidates that match up against the Democratic candidates. Again, it's like you said about New York City. They're not producing the candidates and a message that all but winning a party all the has voters. To have, let's, let's just relax. Go ahead. A can't party relax. has to have a base. That's true. But now the question... And there is no base, right? Well, the There's, question is, how does one define a base? Let's go back I to mean, New York. All right. Uh, maybe I'm just old-fashioned. I haven't been able to adjust to the new techniques in politics. So... I come from, you know, the old club structure, a party structure that really meant something, and a delivering of, spe you know, a whole involvement right. of that party structure. And, and also a platform that was meaningful. I mean, I remember platform debates and arguments. I think that now era you don't is hear past. That. I think that era is past. I don't want to call you a dinosaur, but. So what it is, is it's self identified people who decide to run and their ability to raise money and organize campaigns and organize campaigns with certain principles i think they come basic principles large government versus small right. government and some organizational private, support rights. from what we might call party organizations but again as you suggest it becomes much less party oriented Part of the emerging narrative in this New York election is that we're in the era of post-party politics, that party means less, that ideology means less, and competency and performance mean more, which you're suggesting. I don't know if that's quite true, oh, I'm but not clearly... sure they do mean more. I don't mean to suggest that. Right, but it's possible, and that's sort of the, <laughs> the narrative that's out there, that we're moving into a new type of politics. I'm not sure if we're moving into a new type of politics, but certainly the old type politics is on the well, lane. Well, I think we're in very bad bad politics. Well, that's I mean, what that's, I think, that's, that's what I think issue. is That's what I think is right. my problem, is that the Democratic Party is not performing the way it should. The Democratic organizations in the county are... are they don't exist. They're corrupt or they don't exist. Exactly. Right? They're either going to jail or they've been in jail or something. Or right? about to go to jail. They're small and everything else. They still control... They do control certain things. Right, particularly the, judici the, ju the judiciary. Right. And it's interesting that Bloomberg just recently has started to attack that. And, and not surprising, given his sort of nonpartisan good government approach See, to this it's stuff. It's my thesis. If this had been a Democratic Party of 40 years ago or 50... I, have, I can't quite bring myself... The leaders of the party would have really worked hard to get Bloomberg back into the party. 
But there ain't no leaders of the party. Look at Including, the state level. Look at the local level. Right. There really aren't. So, and they, that, so you said they were either do, dead, dying, or in jail. So why then do we have parties? We have two senators from New York State who are Democrats. Right. But do they involve themselves really in the political workings of the state? No. no. Do they, they don't involve themselves really in, they, they don't even, I don't think, reflect the views of the people in the state right now as far as the war well, in Iraq and stuff like okay, that. Okay, that, right? that may be. But they're, they're, one of them's running for president and one of them. They are less tied to what we would call the p traditional party structures than, than would have been the case 30 years ago. That's certainly the case. The parties are eroding and loyalty to the parties and the parties. Ability to deliver has waned. It's a different world. It's much more so individual focus. So then who frames focused. the policies of the party? I mean, I think Clinton came in and moved the party, or didn't move it, but placed it square in the center, right? right? Fortunately, he was charismatic in addition to that, so right, he was able to do that. Right, but a lot of people who call themselves Democrats find Clinton and Dick Morris's triangulation offensive because they weren't ideological. They were much too pragmatic. So right. you've always got well, this inter-party intra -party competition among Democrats because all they do is fight among one another. Well, well, that's true. But so why then? What about the parties? I mean, wh what do we do to stop that, to make the parties more coherent? To bring a discipline that you have, I, you know what, abroad. Ronnie? I don't know. I don't know. Number one, if it's possible to do, and number two, should it be done? My feeling is, yeah, it should be done because the parties do offer something. How do you do it? It's beyond me. And we talk now about the the money that you need in a campaign. It's driven by that, isn't it? Absolutely. We're running. We're in the era of gazillionaire politics, where money really can frame the agenda. If we move into a politics where rich candidates dominate, I think we're in for trouble. I mean, there's this, there's this assumption that plutocrats equal philosopher kings, that somehow if you are rich, therefore you're not beholden to the special or interest. Or if you're rich, you must be smart. <laughs> oh, rich and you're smart, and rich you're not beholden to the special yeah. interest, and special interests are bad, therefore being rich is good, and somehow you can determine the public interest and act on it. It's bull, but it's out there. That's a belief. So we're going to see it starting in presidential politics. Ah, uh, yeah, well you, saw, well, you saw John Kerry, you know, right. say, I'm not going to do public finance. I'm not right. going to do it. All right, I'm going to fund my own. Let's come back to New York City's Go. public financing campaign. It's leading... It's a leading system in the country. Right. The, I think that this election and the last election point to the fact that we the, the, there's something amiss with campaign finance ref, in, in, in New York City. Clearly, in some senses, it almost is perverse because it advantages people like Bloomberg because they don't have to abide by the limits. They don't have to debate. And then the poor sucker who is in the program is extraordinarily limited in the amount of money that they can raise, et cetera, and, they can, then, that, and what they can spend. So it's really a disadvantage to go into the system. Also, another problem with campaign finance is that you've got all these candidates who are racking up 90 percent of the vote, drawing down public monies. Right. So they're real problems problems with the current campaign finance law that need to be addressed. I thought in the Democratic primary, for instance, it still matters what connections you have. So people who, the kind of thing that campaign finance is, is trying to do, I think, by um, letting other people raise the money and evening it up doesn't really work either because you're able to get, even though the first $250 is the matchable money, you're still able to get a lot of those people contributing to your campaign. That's true, but I think that ultimately it is more of a constraint that more and more people may opt out simply because they can't fund well, the type and of also, campaign necessary. And also, it's been very difficult for some candidates to just get the money out in a timely way. I mean, That's you get, exactly right. You get money the last week of a campaign. You're not That's exactly right. Out. Another criticism of the, the, the way the, the law is applied is that, that it there's a lot of discretion and, and staff and, the, and, and has a lot of discretion in terms of its assessment of candidates and there are a lot of there's a lot of griping about it not only by candidates and consultants by but by outside experts as well so I how can you have campaign finance without some kind of ethical reform I meaning? mean I meaning that if you're if you are um, a member of the city council or if you are let's look at Gifford Miller his speaker of the council so if you have matters in front of the council and you think he, I mean, you're going to give money to him. Yeah, but 
Come on, I mean that's I mean this is this is the real world. The fact that you get money, you've got money from people. Did you owe them? Did you feel obligated? I don't necessarily believe that campaign contributions I got, in some way. I must say when I ran I picked the wrong person you to did. ask. Okay. <laughs> let me let me take another. No, go ahead. I got one contribution from somebody connected to a developer. It happened to be an old friend of mine who worked for the Lindsay administration, but she now worked for Donald Trump, God help us. It was $250, I think. And at a forum, Scott Stringers, one of his strongest supporters, attacked me for taking that money. Of course, fade out, fade in years later, and the whole thing about Scott Stringers' support was all from real estate right. developers. Uh, but I actually didn't get money from people because nobody wanted to, you know, those people <laughs> didn't ever came and talked to me. That's but, right. You were two way out there, uh, um, Ronnie. But it's not right. I don't think if you're chair of a committee and you're running for re-election, you should get money contributed to your election from the people whose committee you, you know, under the jurisdiction. I committee. understand that, and I understand the potential for abuse, but... You have to fund. You have to be able to fund a campaign. Well, then they, How do then you we come do down that? To the basic question: Why can't we? What is the constitutional reason that you can't have total public speech. financing? Well, I mean, it's a question of speech. You can't cut off the flow of mon certain types of money simply because money has been defined by the court in Buckley as speech. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. I think that. That money, given the exigencies of campaigning, one does not have to be beholden to those interests. Certainly, there's a presumption that they're getting something and there's an expectation. But I think you could have relatively clean, effective, good government and still have a system of private contributions. But we also have, we license all of the television operators, all the people who run right. television. It's a public utility, I mean, basically. Um, I don't understand why we can't have a regulation that says you can't sell television time. You have to allot a certain amount I, of time. It, 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 that would be, <laughs> I believe, not being an attorney, I believe that would be legally permissible. And it's got a lot of arguments for it that what drives the expenditures is essentially TV. Provide a certain amount of TV and then you can't buy any more. There are mechanisms by which one could mitigate this, whether they happen or not is another question. Right. How do you, how do you affect the political will? How do you make the will of the people predominate in the discussion of public policy? Well, first of all, you have to define what the will of the people is. I don't know if there is a will of the people or a public good. I mean, the public good is what results out of the process. How you determine what the public good is? You have two hundred million dollars, <laughs> and you tell the people what they want it, what they should want, and you structure public opinion. And in a sense, that's what Mike Bloomberg did in this election. Yeah. That was an interesting thing, the way they did that, the, uh, their polling. Absolutely. Did you know about that? I mean, Yes. I, as a matter of fact, at one point they called it the Big Brother database because what they did was they had a massive amount of data. And the way Let's they structured it was very did. smart. Let's explain what they did. Well, what, what did they, they did? did was rather than simply looking at demographics and, and voting behavior and geography, they asked attitudinal questions on a variety of issues, and they broke the electorate up into a number of categories. and and, and targeted their message to these categories. Basically, they followed George Washington Plunkett. George Washington Plunkett said in the early 1900s, study human nature and act according. And that's what the Bloomberg people did. They looked at people's attitudes on a broad range of issues, collapsed them into certain types, and structured a message that would be targeted to those types. Very effective. They understood that the politics in New York is, and, and elsewhere is simply not the politics of race, class, gender, and geography. It's much much larger than that. And traditionally, we have really, maybe, I mean, has the Democratic Party always appealed to the older kind of classifications? I think it has. I think, generally speaking, New York City politics, and particularly Democratic Party politics, has been tribal, whether the tribes were the Irish in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, or the Italians and the Jews beginning in the 1890s and early 1900s, and then the Hispanics and the blacks. We've had essentially what we would call tribal politics. The question is, are we in an era of post-tribal politics? I don't know. One election or two elections are not enough to set up a trend. I don't think that we're going to ever get out of that tribal politics until we have some aging out and some of the different 
groups of the current political leaders because I think they're thriving on right. I, I don't ethnic differences. I, I don't think that you will eliminate tribal politics, but it's superseded by something else. It's always going to exist because those elements of tribal are some people's principal identifications. But as the Bloomberg database and the election shows, that that's not may not be their primary political attachments anymore. Do you think that term limits affected this election? Not in the oh, turnover, but in the, in the dynamics of the election. I think it did in a number of ways. If you did not have term limits, a controller like Billy Thompson, who might have run, says, well, wait a minute, I don't have to run against this guy now. Yeah. I wait for four years. I have an open seat. I have an open shot. So I think term limits dramatically affect the just, calculation. Or you can just do it with Bloomberg. Why should I bother to change? He's, gonna be, he's doing a good job. He's going to be there for four more years. It's not a, you know, four years is long enough to give anybody a chance to really change things. Okay, that, okay, I, I understand yeah, that yeah. as well. Yeah, I think that term limits on a number of levels affects the fundamental dynamics of politics and not necessarily to the good. Now, we went, we talked about this nonpartisan election and you passed it off very quickly. Do you think there should be another charter? Is the only way to do that is through a charter? Yes, you have to do it to a charter revision commission, but if you're going to have a charter revision commission, you need one that whose chair doesn't say before the commission's formed that we're going to have nonpartisan elections on right. the ballot and structure the way the outcome arose to, to produce a predetermined well, do conclusion. You think and not do only your homework right. They did a miserable job of analysis. Was this, the chairman was Macchiarola? Was Frank that, was Macchiarola. Um, but they've done it before. But do you think also that it was already presented because it was presented by Bloomberg, who we all knew as a Democrat, who ran as a Republican, that that already tainted the vision of making nonpartisan elections? I don't know if that was the case. Nonpartisan elections came in with a very suspect pedigree, and it was, and it was said to have characteristics when, that the scholarship didn't support, and the, the commission and its staff never really addressed those, those issues. But if the mayor, should we urge the mayor to constitute a group or a commission to start studying that in, in depth and well, detail? I don't know. I'm not particularly enamored of nonpartisan yeah. elections, but I could see the mayor having won this election. Among the things that he might do is go back to that because he, he, he sees himself as almost the paragon right. of nonpartisanship. But, but we have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could use, we, even the Democrats maybe should want it. We should, if we combine nonpartisan elections, but still had a party label, there's no reason why you can't have Democrat, Republican next to your name, even though you're all running in the well, same that election. Well, that was part of the Rube right. Goldberg nature of this. They, 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 they added these things on piecemeal. But you meal. could conceivably do that. Yes, you could. And then if we had that other um, uh, uh, instant, um, re, instant... Instant runoff uh, voting. Vote. We would be able to accomplish in one election without damaging primaries where the people in the same party kill each other, without having to have a runoff, which also kills the candidate, the two, the, whoever wins from the right. runoff, uh, we'd be able to have an election with a lot of debate and the opportunity to vote oh, all man. at one time. Oh, now, what's wrong man, with that? You sound naive here. I mean, you're, 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 come on. Let's, do, let's, let's look at this inst instant runoff voting. This instant runoff voting is known in the, the, the vote trade as single transferable vote. It's been used in Europe for generations. It's what we used in the New York school board elections. There were problems with that voting system. Number one, it's very complicated and, and, and the electorate is not likely to understand it. And, and let me just talk like a political scientist for a moment. There are internal problems with that system. In fact, a person with a larger number of votes could conceivably lose the election the way it is counted. They're in the counting of the votes, they're, it can produce anomalous results where the person who ought to win doesn't. It doesn't allow the shifting uh, that you would have in a convention. Well, well that, that's, that's certainly true, yeah. but there's, there are technical problems yeah. with the system that yeah. need to be addressed. Well, maybe All voting systems have uh, problems and trade-offs. This system is not a cure-all. It helps eliminate the runoff, but it may produce other problems. So I'd be real cautious before I you feel particularly <laughs> looking at campaign finance, 
uh, <laughs> nonpartisan in this all at once. The synergistic effects, who knows what's going to happen? Well, it might liven things well, up. You know, well, it would certainly <laughs> liven things up if we could talk I about it. I mean, it would. So what, where are we now? We have a speaker's, the next big race we have to pay attention to is the one for speaker of the city council? Yes, on, uh, <laughs> you know, there are a number of forums. There's one forum sponsored by a number of good government groups and Baruch College, where all the self-selected speaker candidates are going to be appear before the public and answer questions on their stands on issues, their stands on process, on campaign finance, on term limits. If we had more time, I would like very much to discuss the role of a speaker and how a speaker gets elected, because I think when we elect a speaker, in the city at least, it becomes really the second most important Absolutely. job in the city. In the state legislature, certainly we see the the power of the Speaker of the Assembly and the, and the majority leader of the, of the Senate. Senate. And these are people who are elected only by their local constituency and then elected by their colleagues and I, oh, it's a or, system, the, or the county bosses as or well the as their bosses colleagues. That we see. colleagues right. It's a system I think that needs really this exposure. is a system exposure and I think it's a tradition that really could be changed. I think we could do without certain I mean, why do we do that? They say, Oh, it's because it's always been done or it's done. Well, in I Washington. mean that's never a good enough reason. Right. So um, so what do you think is gonna happen there? You think the bosses will prevail? You know what? I think this is extraordinarily difficult, and you're not going to know until the last okay. minute. The bosses are weakened. Brooklyn's divided. Bronx is divided. Manhattan's always, you know that. They're all over the place. The question is Queens. How much can Queens control? I think the power in Queens, Manton's power over that delegation is less than it was in the past. I think this is going to be a real free-for-all. he's free got competing for Queens people that, plus somebody from outside who has some ties there. Absolutely. So I think this is going to be one of these things that is going to be last-minute momentum, quick deals. I don't think anybody can project the outcome so of this. So we're finished with this program, but we still have a lot to talk about. So I hope we're that done. I will be a guest on your program in the next couple of months. You got it. Thank you, Doug Muzio. My pleasure. <laughs>people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore please let me know you can write to me at cuny tv 365 fifth avenue new york new york 10016 or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on contact us i look forward to hearing from you